morning, Salem. It's good to be with you on this week two of our Genesis series. Hey, I want to know, are there any mentalist fans out there? Anybody watch this show back in the day? A few people. The show came out in 2008, and it had maybe a seven, eight season run. I never watched it when it was, uh, you know, on live TV, but a few years ago, my wife and I and our family took a little trip down to her aunt and uncle's house in Missouri, and one of the nights after the kids went to bed, we decided, let's watch a show, and they asked if I'd ever seen this show. It's kind of this CSI-type crime scene thing, and I kind of got hooked on it, so for my next birthday, I asked for a couple DVDs and got those, so this show, The Mentalist, is interesting because this guy, Patrick Jane, is all about keen observation. He notices everything around him so that he can kind of figure out when was the mistake made and who done it? Where where did this problem go and, and how could he solve it? Today, I need you to think like the mentalist. I need you to be keenly observant. We're gonna go to two stories in Genesis and one more story and see how you can observe when was the mistake made so that we can come up with a solution to the problem. So join me as we jump into a couple stories you've heard before. We're gonna go to Genesis three and four. Your job is to be the mentalist. Here we go. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, Pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Okay, here we go. You're the mentalist. You've heard this story probably much of your life. I need you to be keenly observant. When was the mistake made that allowed for sin to occur? I'm going to give you three choices, and you're going to vote with your exuberant shouting. Okay. Number one, when Eve talked to the serpent. Number two, when Eve looked at the fruit. Or number three, when Eve ate the fruit. Remember, we're looking for when was the mistake that allowed the sin to occur? You have to vote for one of these on the count of three. One, two, three. Which one was it? I heard all of them. We stink at being the mentalist. Okay, don't worry, we're gonna have a couple more chances. I believe that the mistake was made when Eve was talking to the serpent. Okay, this is a little bit odd because we talked last week about how God made everything. He made all the animals and he gave us the ability to reason. Remember we talked about this, this ability to think and process and laugh at jokes and all that. God did not give animals the ability to speak. Now, your dog communicates and your parrot might say something back to you, but it's not in their nature to just have a conversation. So the second the snake started talking, well, you know how I feel about snakes. I would have either found a rock or something, and I don't, I don't know, you men out there, you read these stories, you're like, ha it was the woman's fault. No, 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 no. Adam was not on some other side of the garden like tilling the soil. The word of God says he was with her. And I don't know about you men, but if something with a male voice starts talking to my wife, I get a little bit agitated, right? How come Adam didn't go, hey, look at the fruit, well, bam, but he didn't do that. Instead, they're listening and, and Eve is carrying on a conversation with a talking snake. I believe that was a little decision that led to a very hard temptation moment that led to a fall into sin. All right, we're gonna gonna try again. Oh, but this one's kind of funny. I'm guessing you won't be the last ones not to read the Apple terms and conditions. (laughs) 
That's just goofy. Okay, uh, let's go to the second story, Cain and Abel. Uh, we know from the word of God, Genesis 4, Adam and Eve had at least two children that we know of in that chapter. Uh, Cain is the firstborn, Abel is the second. Okay, Genesis 4, two through eight. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Okay. The first death in all of scripture recorded, and it was a murder. Hmm. When did the mistake occur that allowed the sin to happen? I'm gonna give you three choices, and you're gonna vote exuberantly. Number one, when Cain, Cain became jealous angry. Number two, when Cain invited Abel to the field. Or number three, when Cain killed Abel. When was the mistake that allowed the sin to occur? One, two, or three, everybody shout it out, ready, go. Hey, you are the mentalist. Way to go. I believe it was when Cain looked something like that. He brought some of the gleanings from his field. And here's Abel with his cute little lamb, the firstborn of his flock. And they're creating an offering to the Lord. And somehow God communicated to them that he loved this offering, but this one wasn't so good. God asked us to bring the best, the first fruits. Now, I could have shown you lots of graphic pictures, but I'm gonna show you this one that's a little fuzzy, the Lego version. Look at how mad Cain looks right there. Very angry, okay. yeah. It's the the little mistakes that lead to the hard temptation moments that lead to the fall into sin and brings pain upon our lives or others. It's amazing. Those are two situations from the book of Genesis. Let's go to one more situation. Let's think about we are tempted by Let's think about us for a second. And I need you to be the mentalist. I need you to have keen observation about everything that happens in our world. This message is about Adam and Eve, yes, and Cain and Abel, yes, but they're humans just like us who struggle. So let's think about some things that we might be tempted by. In and of themselves, they're not bad. Alcohol's not bad. Money's not bad. Facebook, well, In and of itself, it's not bad. Okay, Uh, what about like prescription drugs? Those aren't bad, they're designed to help. What about the internet or movies? Ooh, what about food or coworkers? You may argue with me that some of these things are inherently bad, but I believe it's the little decisions about these kind of things that lead us to some hard temptation moments where we fall and we fail, we disobey, and we bring pain upon our lives or others. You could easily put an arrow next to any of these and go to where it goes wrong. I think it's interesting that God's word says, when God is speaking to Cain, he says, sin is crouching at your door. But God starts with, if you do not do what is right, if you make the wrong little decision, 
Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Man, that's a tough verse. Because I look at stuff like this and I go, I haven't mastered sin very well at all. Any of these can lead to unhealthy relationships or things that are going to cause harm for us. Man, these little decisions. Let's think about some of the pain that those first few sins in our world, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, let's think about some of the pain that that brought as we kind of analyze our own pain. Then the eyes of both Adam and Eve were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Here enters shame. And it's ever a part of our life now. He, Adam, answered God, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Fear, trying to hide the sin that we have made. The man, Adam said to God, the woman you put here with me, or the woman you put here with me, depends who he's blaming there, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. All I see here is selfish blame. And it's easy to point our fingers at them. Now, if you lived in my house, you would see this a lot. It is hard when we get caught or when we do something wrong at any age to go, oh, yeah, totally messed up, my fault. It is way easier to go, not nah, but, but they, no, you, you don't understand. We are kings and queens at blaming others, and that's selfish. We're trying to make ourselves look good, and Adam and Eve, our first parents, showed us exactly how to do it. All right, now let's go to the story of Cain and Abel. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. This story makes me think Cain was a teenager, right here. Cain is a teenager. Am I my brother's keeper? God's word doesn't tell us how old he is. I'm just thinking. I don't know, except I killed him a little bit ago and I buried him some. I don't know where he is. And here enters lies to the situation and how much pain that can drum up when we don't tell the truth. God says back to Cain, when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Regret, loneliness, loneliness. Think of the pain that Adam and Eve experienced in that moment. We know they had two children because they're listed. We also know they had a daughter because Cain took a wife with him. That's his sister. Okay, don't get freaked out about that. Potentially, Adam and Eve became empty nesters with grief and loss on a single day. Now Genesis 4 continues that they had another son named Seth, and some of the genealogies kind of start there. Wow, the pain, the the hurt, the, the grief they would feel, the sense of loss, maybe the anger they would feel towards their own son, Cain, because of a little mistake that led to a hard temptation that led to a fall into his sin and serious pain. Is God a God who just punishes? Is he this this authority figure that just is, is he the one that's waiting, crouching, ready to smite us for everything we've done wrong? I suppose if you only hear what I've shared so far, Genesis three and four might feel like God is going there. That's where you messed up. But some of the verses I didn't share is God's promise. Genesis 3.15, 
talking about how he's going to send someone to crush the head of Satan. We believe that to be Jesus. God's provision that he clothed Adam and Eve before he sent them out of the garden. God's protection. He told Cain, no, 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 I'm going to protect you. No one's going to kill you. And his presence that was with Adam and Eve from the very beginning when he created them, when he sent them out of the garden, God's presence who went with Cain and Abel to the field at a moment of death and murder, God's presence who went with Cain and his wife banished away from his family, God's presence that has been with all of the Bible characters you could ever name, and God's presence who goes with you, he will never leave you nor forsake you, the Bible says. These are things about our God that it is so critical for us to remember even when we fail. Think about 1 John chapter 1. These are words that I grew up saying in church, maybe you did too. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. You might think you're uh, keeping the truth from someone else or God, maybe he didn't see that. We're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is what? He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us, cleanse us, make us whole again from all unrighteousness. Whatever the sinful moments, whatever the tempting moments, whatever the little mistakes that lead to them, God cleanses us from those moments because of his grace. He's faithful, he will forgive, and he has forgiven us. Patrick Jane said this in one of the episodes of The Mentalist. What's important to know is that a man will go to extreme lengths to find peace, as I must do now. Patrick Jane did not have a lot of peace in his soul. If you know the storyline, it starts with he's looking for the murderer of his wife and his daughter, and he's going for vengeance. He's searching for peace. Friends, we don't have to search for peace. God has given it freely in Jesus. Look at this verse from Ephesians chapter 2. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, banished because of your sin, not out of the Garden of Eden, not away from your family, but separated from a holy God, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace. We don't have to search for it. God says, I am the peace that passes all understanding, the peace in your heart to know that you are forgiven in Jesus. His blood, his grace, his forgiveness is yours now and always. Maybe this can be one final kind of encouragement to you when you have to make a decision about something little that could lead to a really hard temptation moment, that could lead to your fall, that could lead to some pain in your life or others, God's word says no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Adam and Eve faced it, Cain and Abel faced it, Moses, David, Abraham, the disciples, Paul, They've all faced these kind of temptations. You're not unique. The things you're struggling with right now, if we were to really be honest and say, show of hands, who's struggling with that? You would not be the only hand in this room. And probably my hand would go up on a lot of those things too. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So many people twist this verse and they say, God will never give you more than you can handle. Not what the verse says. God's word says, when you are tempted, it will not be beyond what you can bear. If you go back 10 minutes, if you go back two hours to the little decision, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit going, ah, uh uh-uh. Or, no, that doesn't honor your spouse. Or, no, that's not glorifying God. Listen to the voice, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. And you could go home today and go, that wasn't very encouraging. 
because I don't stand up under it very well. God's way out is also his loving grace and his forgiveness. I believe he's going to work in your heart and mind to go, ah, careful. Don't talk to the snake. Don't get jealous, angry. But even when we fail, God's grace covers us and he gives us a way out so that we're not banished anymore from his presence. That's good news for us today, for the first parents we ever had, for Cain, for Abel, for all the people in the Bible, for you and me. Let's pray and thank God for that. Lord God, we thank you for the moments in life where you give us strength to stand up under temptation. But Lord, so often we don't. We fail, we give in. Lord, we are sinners in desperate need of your grace. And we thank you that you have provided a way out of our banishment. That though we were once far away, you have brought us near through the blood of Jesus. Lord, give us assurance of your love and forgiveness that goes with us now and for all eternity. And help us to live as people that show your love in a tangible way to other people when they're hurting. God, we thank you for the strength you provide and for the forgiveness that is ours in you, your promise, your protection, your provision, and your presence. We love you, Lord Jesus, and pray in your name. Amen.